So let's dig in. If you remember from geography, and I'm sure you do, I was took geography class, of course, in the late 1800s, nevertheless. <laughs> Estimates were then, I don't know if that's going to change with all the melting of the glaciers, but this planet is about three quarters water with about 25% solid matter. So it's, that's been holding pretty steady. And you know, with all the global warning, warming stuff, you know the potential dangers that we are facing on this planet with alteration of severe weather. Even, for example, polar bears not finding enough ice to float on and they drown because they can't keep swimming forever. So there are consequences to this ratio when it's altered by severe weather. Well, the human body, probably no surprise, is very similar in terms of ratio. Body's about three quarters water and 25% solid. Just like some of the things we're facing on this planet, there are potential dangers to your brain and body when this ratio gets out of balance. If it gets out of balance by even 1%, you're going to be in trouble. So what's a nutrient? It's a noun. My mother was a language teacher. She taught English, French, and Latin. I have no idea why we had to learn Latin in Canada. Everybody had to take two years of Latin. It's a dead language. <laughs> However, it does form the basis for a lot of English, and so that did help. So it's a noun. It's defined as a substance that provides nourishment. And this is the piece that's important. That is essential for the maintenance of life and for growth. An essential nutrient, as I'm sure you remember from school, something that's essential, is that you the body doesn't make it on its own. You have to take it in from the outside. And if you don't get it in from the outside, in the amounts that the body needs, then the brain and body are not going to be functioning optimally. There are six categories of what we call essential nutrients. Carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, and water. And we're going to go really quickly through them just to give you some sense of the reason that these are essential nutrients. Carbohydrates, they've been getting a bad rub lately. <laughs> Too many carbs, cut out the carbs. Well, I'm here to tell you that carbohydrates are the main energy source, main energy source for the brain, for the nervous system, and for the body, especially in terms of muscles. So we have no idea what the long-term effect on brain and body is going to be when people quit eating carbs, because it is the main energy source. They're simple carbs, as I'm sure you know, and that's anything that has one or two sugar molecules, and that's usually whole fruit. Just because they're simple doesn't mean you never eat it, but you be aware of how much you eat. You can eat way too large a proportion of sugar in your diet, and it's going to impact your brain negatively. They digest really quickly, so they are a very fast energy source. You may know that when somebody, for example, who has diabetes, has run out of blood sugar, what do the doctors and nurses usually give them? Juice. Orange juice or a piece of fruit because it's fast energy source and it will help to smooth out that blood sugar. And then there are complex carbohydrates, which of course you want to eat more of because complex is more sustaining energy. It's not really fast like the sugars. And those are called starch molecules instead of sugar molecules. And so that's green and starchy vegetables, 
I love sweet potatoes. I love broccoli. Uh, beans, other kinds of legumes, whole grains, preferably ancient grains, unrefined, unprocessed, and anything that's got plant fiber. The healthiest carbohydrates are unrefined and unprocessed whole foods. And it doesn't mean you haven't ground the grain up so it cooks, but it's not refined. All the good stuff has not been taken out. I love it when people say, oh, but my bread is, it's got nutrients in it. It may be totally white flour, but it says right on there, enriched. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Matt, picture you got a hundred bucks in your wallet. Mm -hmm. You give me your wallet, I take out 99. I put one back in and give it to you. Your wallet is now enriched. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> so, how much do you need? Estimates run from 45 to 3 quarters, 75% of your daily food intake, depending on how active you are. Every morning when I do my smoothie with Delta E and Enterprise, <laughs> I tend to put in a cup of blueberries because they are the best berry antioxidant as far as we know. But then I throw in a couple of carrots and some celery and some fresh parsley. And I'm actually getting more of the complex carbs than I am of the simple, although those blueberries are wonderful, so I have them every single day. The range depends on how active you are. I mean, if you're one of these poor guys out on the highway, you know, digging ditches, you're going to need more carbs because your muscles are going to give out if you don't have enough carb for energy. But if you're like me, I exercise every day, but I'm digging no ditches, then I'm going to need less. You know, I usually aim for about 50, 55%. But it depends on the weather, your body configuration, how you're using your muscles, and so on. So that's why there's a range. Second are proteins. And we get just as messed up with proteins in this culture as we do with carbohydrates. I know people who are, try to eat only protein. And I'm going, you're going to wreck your kidneys. They're going to stress your liver. Hello? Proteins, in the form of amino acids, are the major structural component of cells. You can't build cells. You can't multiply and divide healthy cells unless you've got enough amino acids. They repair the brain and body. 20 known amino acids. 11 of them the body can make. If you give it quality nutrition, they can make 11 of them. But they can't make the other nine. You have to take those in through what you eat. So again, we've got a range, 10 to 35 percent of plant proteins, preferably because there's so much less problem with plant proteins in terms of metabolism in the body and waste products. And so then you've got all the legumes and the nuts, certainly eggs and lean meats if you if you want to have meats. But the current the recommendation is that meat is a condiment, it's not a main dish. And that's a little scary for some people who have used to been used to eating, you know, a big portion of meat three times a day. Hmm, I've met them and I say, you know, plant proteins, according to the China study, are the healthiest protein with the least side effect and you can get all you need. And they kind of grab and share and say, You mean no more steaks? And I go, You can eat whatever you want. But remember, you're responsible for what goes into your body, and so there's no point complaining about your state of health if you haven't been putting in good stuff. Fats. Problems with understanding fats. They're an energy source, but they're not designed to be the primary energy source. What's the primary energy source? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. So, low carb, high fat diet is sort of backwards. And eventually, you may pay a price for that. You need a certain amount of fat, definitely, to even absorb fat soluble vitamins, which, of course, some of the major ones are A, D, E, and K. Polyunsaturated fats are believed to be the healthiest. 
avocado, I eat avocado every single day. Avocado not only has good healthy fats, but it contains phenylethylamine, the same kind of chemical that your body produces when you meet somebody and you think you've just fallen in love. <laughs> so I eat some every single day. <laughs> Sorry, I'm serious. It goes in my smoothie. Uh, olives, walnuts, seeds, fish. Uh, coconut oil for cooking primarily because heat does not alter its DNA and virgin olive oil for cold food preparation as in salads and again we got a range 20 to 35 percent of daily intake of healthier fats so every day I have avocado and usually walnuts and every once in a while a couple three times a week some olives I was dismayed when I got back from Australia because I missed the food at home. You know, you, you get familiar. I mean, I don't know how you feel, Greg, but you might miss Korean food. I don't. But I do miss American food. But I don't. <laughs> My sister in law is Korean, and she would complain. She'd say, it just doesn't taste the same here. Even when I make it in the kitchen, it doesn't taste the same. Well, after 37 days, I'm dying for American food. So I got back home and I went to the old spaghetti factory. Yep. And I like to have their big salad. And I like to have an order of steamed broccoli. And I like olive tapenade. It's not on the menu anymore. I don't know where it went. <laughs> Gonna have to have a word with the old spaghetti factory. <laughs> okay, so then we've got vitamins. I'm not going to spend any time on this. You know vitamins are critically important. Uh, vitamin C, you can't even make collagen. You know, that keeps your skin from, you know, falling down around your ankles. <laughs> uh, provides structure to your blood vessels. Uh, you have to have vitamin C. It's in every single cell membrane in your entire brain and body. It's in your bones. Uh, in the ligaments that keep your joints together. And of course, vitamin D is really important to main calcium homeostasis and B vitamins, which are the brain vitamins. Some recent research is suggesting that you probably need some B vitamins because you may not get enough in your food. That's one of the reasons I'm very pleased that Delta E has B12 in it. But if you're taking B vitamins, look for methylated. B vitamins because that's more completely and easily absorbed. And then we've got the minerals. And most people think of minerals only in terms of bones. Well, they make hormones. So if you don't have enough minerals, you may not be making enough of the kind of hormones that you need. Regulates heartbeat for another thing. Uh, the sodium potassium balance is becoming a big thing now in medicine. Uh, sodium helps to maintain fluid volume outside the cell and potassium primarily maintains it inside the cell but it can also do some of both. Many people suffer from high blood pressure when this ratio is not right and if you help them learn to eat properly so that you've got the right ratio sometimes they can completely get off high blood pressure medication if not significantly lower it. And of course, calcium for bones and teeth. So that's number five. And number six is water. It's its own category. You gotta have it for everything that happens in your brain and body. I don't care what it is. Homeostasis, keeping everything in balance, transporting nutrients that come in through the first five types of uh, categories. Uh, lubricates your joints, actually helps to cushion some of the organs, regulates temperature, and that's the problem that we're seeing with all of this heat. Because if you don't have enough water, you cannot regulate your temperature. And heat stroke can be lethal and impact you the rest of your whole life. Certainly helps remove waste, helps you avoid constipation. Uh, moistens tissues, reduces wrinkling, 
uh, prevent shrinkage of brain tissue. We'll talk about that a little more. It dissolves macro and micro nutrients so that they can be digested and absorbed. You know, the macro nutrients are anything that has calories. And the micronutrients are all the other stuff like vitamins and enzymes that you need, but they really don't add calories. And you must have it to generate hydroelectric power that's stored as ATP. And hopefully you already know that. If you think of an electro hydroelectric a hydroelectric plant where water is running over the dam or whatever and turning the turbines to generate electricity, and then your water source slows down, the turbines are not going to function properly. They don't they can't make enough electricity and if it gets a dribble of water it can stop working altogether. As water passes in and out of the cells, that acts just like a hydroelectric plant. And that's what gives you energy. So if you don't have enough to be moving in and out of your cells regularly, you're out of energy. So of these six essential categories of nutrients, which is the most important? Water. 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 Absolutely. We need all the rest, but water you cannot absolutely live without for very many days. You can go without any of the others for perhaps up to two weeks, as long as you're getting water. But without water, you're in trouble. It's considered the most important nutrient because the body is a solution. That's all it is. It's a solution of approximately 70% water. Now these numbers, depending on the research you know, study that you read, can vary by a percentage or two, but these are in general. So blood, of course, 83%, because it has to flow through your veins and arteries and capillaries. Bones, 22%. A lot of people are surprised to realize that bones are nearly one-fourth water. The brain, at least 75%. But the neurons, the thinking cells in the brain, are about 85% water. So you've got an overall percentage in the brain, but you've got a cellular percentage. Your heart's nearly 80%, kidneys 83 liver 86 because it's your, oh dear, what would you call it? Your environmental sanitation department. <laughs> and it needs a lot of water to wash away the toxins and so on. And then muscles, believe it or not, have three quarters. Which is why people working out with their muscles in the heat don't get enough water. They're in deep doo-doo, as my kids used to say. Survival. Humans have been known to survive up to eight weeks without food if they have water. But they have to have water. Without water, you're looking at three to seven days, which is really not very much. And it's pretty painless, but it doesn't take long. So when people are in hospice and they have decided they don't want anything else done for them, they just stop giving them water. It does not hurt. And they gradually, the brain just stops functioning and they die a nice, pretty painless death. But it's very quick after you decide that they decide they don't want to drink water anymore. Normally, there's more water inside cells than outside. But dehydration reverses that ratio, and that becomes a problem. That means that the cells are shrinking and wrinkling. They're not nice and puffed up like a big bunch of grapes. Sometimes it can be less than three days, one of the physicians said that 100 hours at an average temperature outdoors is probably what you could, what you could plan on. But it depends on what, what your body weight to start with. 
You know, if you have had a lot of stress and a lot of, you know, corticotropin releasing factor released in your body and, and you don't have an appetite and you go into this without water, somewhat anorexic, you're not going to last that long. Uh, some genetic variation, the research doesn't specify what that is. You know, it doesn't say, well, if you're Irish, you can live longer. <laughs> uh, your level of health, and whether, whether you have any dehydration to start with, because if you start out dehydrated, then you're in big trouble. How much do you need on a daily basis? And this has been arguments for years. You need eight glasses of fluid a day. It doesn't have to be water. Or, no, you need eight glasses of water, fluid, and soup doesn't count. Well, it all depends. It depends on an awful lot. It depends on how active you are. It depends on the temperature. It depends on your age. It depends on a lot of things. So researchers are now saying, and I'm pretty sure I've talked to you about this before, you take in enough water, whatever else you take in, so that you can pee one or two pale urines a day. And it's fun sometimes to speak about that when men ask me, well, how am I going to know if I <clears throat> have a pale urine? I said, well, you're going to look. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. <laughs> Any of you have little kids who are learning to use the bathroom and the toilet? And they're running around yelling any, for anybody they can grab to come and look what I did. <laughs> so you look. It's not rocket science here. But you want one or two pale urines a day, and that's going to mean on hot days like we've been having more water. And if you don't drink more water, you risk becoming a pea brain. <laughs> Maybe. There's never a big supply of water in the body. But at any given time, the most you have is where? Water. In your bladder, exactly. And if you're dehydrated, that may be precious little. But the most you have will be in your bladder. And the other body organs give way to the brain if there's a shortage of something. They will say, okay, take mine. You know, like a mother in a starvation situation, she says to the kid, here, you take mine. You know, they will say to the brain, you take it. Because without the brain, they're in history. <laughs> so the brain will tell the bladder, dehydrate some of that fluid you've got and send me up some fluid. And to me, that is just painfully ugly. I mean, I just cannot imagine urine coming up to nourish my brain. I mean, that to me is the quintessential definition of a pea brain. Yes. <laughs> and you really want to avoid that. There are a few conditions that medicine says, maybe you've got to be really careful for a while about water. So if you've been told you have one of them, well, check it out. But that's not the majority of people. So how do we lose water? Every time you breathe out. You breathe water out. If you're breathing very hard, sometimes if the sun's just right, you can actually see a little spray coming out of the person's nose. Had a little, got into a little trouble with allergies back east. It's one of the reasons I do live on the west coast. I was born and raised in the eastern part of Canada, and let me tell you, there's no people there, but there's a lot of green stuff. Out west, my allergies are usually much better, so I just got back from South Carolina. And here we go again. Not so many people, but lots of green stuff. So this too will pass. So every time you exhale, you lose water. You Every time you perspire, you lose water. And when it's really, really hot, you never feel the sweat. It evaporates as fast as it leaves your body trying to keep you cool. And it can be really challenging to get enough water. Uh, certainly through urine and feces you lose some, and if you get sick and throw up, that's one of the problems with anorexia. When you throw up, you also throw up a lot of the enzymes, minerals, and vitamins there. And I think that's probably what happened to Karen Carpenter, you know, with her heart problems. She uh, threw up so much that she just, the heart couldn't keep going with such a lack of 
enzymes. One of the things a lot of people don't know is ethanol, alcohol. On a hot day, I watch people sitting out on their patio drinking gallon after gallon after gallon of wine and wine coolers, not drinking at least an equal amount of water. And what happens is that ethanol depresses the level of anti anti diuretic hormone, meaning, meaning it's it's designed to regulate, not putting out such a high percentage of urine. And so when you are drinking alcohol and not drinking water with it, and tell me how many people you see with a glass of alcohol and a glass of water. Almost none. <laughs> And so they increase their urine volume, put, putting it out, to the extent where more fluid is lost in urine than they even get in the drink. Which some people think is one of the reasons that people who drink a lot have a lot of wrinkles. Because their cells don't have enough water in them and their skin gets wrinkled. Trust me, if your skin is wrinkled, your body organs are wrinkled. So it's really important if you drink, to drink at least an equal amount of water while you're drinking the alcohol. So let's talk about mild, moderate, and severe symptoms of dehydration. When you start to get dehydrated, one of the things that people start noticing is they don't seem to have as much saliva. So now they're chewing food and it feels like cotton in their mouth. And so that's uncomfortable. They are not peeing the amount of urine that they usually do. They don't even go to the bathroom that often. And the urine usually is not even close to being pale. It's a deep yellow-orange color. And it often has a really strong urine odor. The problem that I'm very concerned about is what even mild dehydration does to the brain. So this is a drawing of the brain. You see there's the skull. The blue mark there are those three meningeal coverings that protect the brain. And then you get to the brain tissue. I mean, that's a really well hydrated looking brain. You get dehydrated even one or two percent. And now this is what it's more likely to look like. There's your skull, there's your meninges, there's your brain, and that those meninges have pulled away from the skull. And you've got a space there because your brain tissue is shrinking. Brain shrinkage is linked with dementia. I plan to avoid that. So not only is that happening to the brain, but you're going to start feeling weak and very fatigued. We've already talked about that. What might be the reason that now you start not having a lot of energy? Lack of water moving in and out of the cells functioning as a hydroelectric plant. Many researchers believe that dehydration is probably the most harmful type of stress. We don't even recognize it as a stressor, but it is so majorly impacting the brain and body. It is probably the most harmful type of stress. A couple of statistics you might find fun. 1% level of dehydration, 1%. You're getting 99% hydration. 1% dehydration gives you a 5% decrease in cognitive function. So when I was a school nurse and traveling around the United States, especially in parts where it was really hot, they didn't even have air conditioning in the schools for the kids. They had them in the offices for the educational superintendent, <laughs> but not the kids. <laughs> so it can be 97 degrees in there, and they don't have enough water, they're getting dehydrated, and they can't think. 1% will give you a 5% decrease in cognitive function, which is pretty scary. So you just think it was kind of fuzzy. 
Math confusion, you can't do math. Talk about trigonometry, geometry, algebra, give me a break. And they can't focus. You know, the teacher keeps trying to call them back to pay attention and they can't focus. And again, I, I just really want to emphasize, if you drink, you must drink water. So if you have people over to your place and they bring their own bottle and you start pouring it out, you bring out a pitcher of water. And I tell them, I want you to drink at least as much, if not more, for every ounce you drink of anything that's got alcohol in it. And they look at me and they go, why? I'm going to say, well, the brain can't really answer the question, why? But I'll tell you the research. And that's the research. So remember that, because you can perhaps even role model that to people. So now we come to moderate dehydration, which is, of course is higher than 1%. You have even less urine. Now you don't just have a feeling that you don't have a lot of saliva. Your mouth is dry. And you can look at people, especially when they bring them into the emergency room. They've been out walking in the desert without even one bottle of water. And their eyes will almost be sinking back in their head. I mean, you still can see their eyes. But it's just like, you know, they're sinking back in there. And their heartbeats are usually very rapid. Because now you don't have enough water inside the muscle cells of the heart. And so what the heart would usually do easily in one good beat because of the sufficient hydration, uh, it can't do that. So it starts to try to beat faster to try to get this blood throughout the body. And then when you get to severe dehydration, which is probably at least anything about 5%, you don't have any urine at all. And you can see this in babies. They bring babies into the emergency department who are very sick. And the nurse will say, when did the baby last pee? Mm -hmm. I don't know. He hasn't had a, a wet diaper for at least a whole day. That can be lethal. Because the younger the person, the more sensitive they are to the dehydration. Uh, lethargy. I don't feel like doing anything. So I used to love to have people come over and play with me. I'm just sitting there going, hi, come on in, sit down. Just don't want to do anything. Irritability. So if people start getting irritable that are rarely irritable, before you even try to talk to them, and you never want to argue anyway, give them a glass of water. Maybe by the time they get it down, they'll stop being irritable and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, certainly, if with some illnesses, um, they'll be vomiting and diarrhea, which is really surprising because there's really nothing there to, you know, we used to call that the dry heaves. There's really nothing to bring up, but the body's doing it. And if you lose 10% of your body's water, that can lead to a life-threatening, what we call heat stroke, which means that the thermostat in your brain, all the cells even in the thermostat are so dehydrated, they cannot keep the temperature in balance. And that, uh, that's pretty lethal. Some other problems, which on another time maybe we can go through. You'll have an acid alkaline imbalance. You'll have way too much acid, not nearly enough alkaline. And one of the reasons I like to drink alkaline nice water is because when it's really hot, if I drink all the water in my car, um, and then I get home to drink some more, I've got a little cushion because I'm already pretty alkaline. Constipation, it's amazing to me. These people come in to the emergency department and say, I can't poop. <laughs> and I'll say, well, I regret that. <laughs> so let's talk about what you're doing. How, uh, how much water are you drinking a day? Water? I don't like water. What are you drinking? Oh, you know, sodas, uh, Seven Up, stuff like that. And I'm going, the more sugar in the drink, the more water it's going to take for the body to digest the drink. You're dehydrating yourself. And sometimes it's pretty ugly. 
You know, we have to resort to the nurse and her finger picking stuff out so that, you know, there's not this big lump of something. It's not funny. It's really not funny. It can be very life threatening and most unpleasant if you're the nurse who's assigned High blood pressure, again, because the blood isn't thin enough. Uh, immune suppression, the immune fluid, the immune vessels and the lymph are not liquid enough to really go through the body. A weight gain, because many people think they're hungry when they're thirsty, and so they eat food, but there's not even enough water to help the food digest, so that just increases constipation. Do you see how this gets to be a really ugly cycle? And then I've talked about wrinkling of skin and internal body organs. Now I am aiming to live a minimum of 122 years, 165 days. That comes from Jean-Louis Calmont of France, who when she died was 122 years old, 164 days. <laughs> <laughs> so at 122 and 165 days, I expect to have a fair amount of wrinkling because I don't have good skin like Anita's. But I didn't choose my parents, so <laughs> Uh, it is what it is, but I wrinkle ten times faster than she does. I mean, she could even be older than I am, and I look older. Well, I have to stay hydrated to minimize that, or it's going to be really ugly. <laughs> Fruit juices, sodas, soft drinks, any sugary beverages. Coffee with six cubes of sugar in it. Hot chocolate with eight. <laughs> it promotes dehydration because the only way the body metabolizes sugar is using water. So if you don't have enough water and you're drinking all this stuff, it's going to be a problem. And that's the reason I always take Delta E and Enterprime in water. I personally never take it in juice, ever. Coconut water or plain water? Well, not plain water. I own Thrive alkaline water. But that's the reason I do that. I do not want to interfere whatsoever with the body's metabolism as it tries to, to process all of this sugary stuff. And I've told Greg this before. You know, I really try to keep everything in balance in my life. But the one that I track most is hydration. And that was one of the reasons I was so pleased when Impacts discovered the Ion Thrive machine because it mm, works for me. And when I'm in Australia for 37 days, I'm not complaining. You, know, you do what you do when you have to travel. The first thing I do when I get home is plug in my machine and get me a big picture of water and I'm going, oh yeah, this is good. I remember what this was like. <laughs> because they don't have a lot of ionizing whatever over there. So that is the reason that my source is Ion Thrive. You don't have to have alkaline water. You can survive almost on any kind of water. But the brain and body work best in a slightly alkaline environment. And when you drink water that is leaning toward acid, the body has to work with that water and try to bring it into an alkaline state so that it's utilized more easily in the body. So I'm going, well, that seems like a no-brainer to me. <laughs> How come you would want the body to have to take this water and make it more alkaline before it can really start using it? Why not put in water that's basically alkaline? Hmm. You know, on my machine, 
I did mine at the third level, which is what, 9.5, something yes. like that? And I'm hoping that helps to compensate for the things that happen when I'm out and there's tap water. But I'll drink tap water before I'll not drink water. Or I'll carry it in my car, but I'm not always in my car. So not only am I getting some purification, but I'm getting something that's already alkaline, which my brain's opinion is makes it easier on my body. I tell you, just let me get home for two or three days. I've only been home for one, but two or three days, and I'm already feeling more energy. And I think it has to do with that. Just my brain's opinion. And then, of course, hmm, with all the pesticides and all that other stuff, I like the option. Whoops. Now, where did that go? I like the option of being able to clean, you know, those fruits and vegetables and so on, and just makes me feel a little bit better about it. So there's a little bit about water, and there's tons more research coming out. So maybe the next time I come, we can do a part two. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.